Welcome back to the Startup Showdown podcast, where we discuss pitching, funding, and scaling startups. Join us as we interview winners, mentors, and judges of the monthly $120,000 pitch competition powered by Panoramic Ventures. We also discuss the latest updates in software, Web3, healthcare tech, fintech, and more. Now sit tight as we interview this week's guest and their journey through entrepreneurship. Lee Cantor here, another episode of Startup Showdown, and this is going to be a good one, so I hope you get your pencil and paper ready. You're going to learn a lot from this guest today. But before we get started, it's important to recognize our sponsor, Panoramic Ventures. Without them, we couldn't be sharing these important stories. Today on Startup Showdown, we have Larry McHugh, and he is with Atlanta Technology Angels. Welcome, Larry. Glad to be here, Lee. Well, Thanks. Um, for those who aren't familiar, can you share a little bit about Atlanta Technology Angels, how you're serving folks? Sure. Uh, I joined them several years ago and have been on the board for a little over five years. The Atlanta Technology Angels, or ATA, it's a nonprofit organization run by its members. Uh, the individual members are uh, accredited investors. And what we do is we connect early stage startups to capital. And then can you explain uh, for people maybe that aren't super clear the difference between like an angel, a VC, private equity? Can you explain kind of the stages? Stages is a good word. Um, The first stage when an entrepreneur is getting started, it's usually backed by friends and family because they have so little traction generally. And when they do get some traction, meaning some paying customers, that's a good time to go look for angel investors when they need some revenue to scale. They've got something, they've got a minimum viable product, uh, they've got it in the market, they've identified the problem, they have a solution, and they need some revenue to scale. So that's where angels usually come in. And then as they progress into what's often called a series A, that's when the venture capitalists get involved. A typical angel investment might be uh, 100, 200, 300 thousand dollars where venture capitalists will start uh, in the millions, uh, usually around three to five million dollars. So the, the valuation of the company has increased dramatically, as is the, the funding levels. And then the reason a person decides to become an angel versus a VC is, is it just they like <laughs> early stage, uh, you know, companies more the the, you know, formation, foundation, building blocks of those companies more than that's something that's kind of ongoing and already kind of passed a certain test. That's a good way to put it, Lee. I got involved uh, after being a mentor at Georgia Tech's ATDC for several years, and I supported the entrepreneurs there as a mentor. And then there are several ATA members who are mentors at the ATDC. And one of them asked me to come to a meeting about um, with the ATA and I went to a couple of meetings, checked them out, which anybody else can do as well, and then got involved, um, well, I'd say about seven years ago. And the, the attraction to me was uh, supporting entrepreneurs is something I've been doing for over 10 years. And the investment part is just the ability to help support them a little financially. Um, with the ATA and most other angel groups, it's the individual members decide if they want to invest in a company, and if so, for how much. So our average investment this year, um, we've done, uh, let's see, we've done six deals this year so far with an average investment of about $100,000. And generally speaking, there's more than one group um, that invests in a round for uh, an angel uh, in, in the startups. And your uh, background a little bit, uh, you came from a startup or did you come from enterprise uh, and then kind of got into startups later? That's good. More, more like uh, enterprise. I joined uh, the Weather Channel back when cable television was disruptive technology, disrupting broadcast. And they brought me to Atlanta to be advertising sales manager in 1989 And things were growing very well. We had very rapid growth, uh, good profitability early on. And this thing called the Internet came along in the mid-90s, and literally nobody knew what to do with that. 
Uh, Weather.com became one of the significant players in the early days. And the next technology to jump in was mobile technology. And if you look at your phone, the Weather Channel is the number one, or at least it was, the number one app on phones, and usually preloaded on uh, both Android and Apple phones. So uh, I moved with the technology as it started, but uh, it's, it was a fun ride. I was with the Weather Channel uh, for about 13 years in, in their high growth era. Now, when you're working today, when you're working with these founders, uh, a lot of them are first time founders or they're new entrepreneurs, and maybe they don't have kind of a family background of coming from other entrepreneurs. How do you um, kind of work with them? What is the, like, what's an example of a, a meeting you would have with a founder? What are some of the questions you ask and, and what do you expect them to be prepared with? Uh, there's actually courses to teach entrepreneurs to get ready. Uh, in fact, the ATA leads a seminar at the ATDC called Investor Readiness, which uh, is a two-hour seminar that helps entrepreneurs with what they need to know, how they need to be organized, right down to uh, how big the type on their pitch deck should be. So uh, there's a lot of preparation that goes into it. And one of the first things, uh, there are several key things that we look for. Number one is, a, is, as my friend Nelson Chu would say, a hair on fire kind of problem. And oftentimes the entrepreneur has personally dealt with that particular problem and knows it maybe from a family member or from their corporate experience, whatever. Um, but the, the, you start with the problem and then you get into the technology, which is the solution. And if I can understand the problem and the solution, not necessarily the technology, I'm not a technologist, um, but if I can understand those two things, then we look at the team uh, do they have a, a, a strong team that knows what they're doing, knows the industry, has appropriate experience, appropriate balance, you know, not just engineers, not just MBAs, but a good balance of, of skills. And the cliche is often that investors are betting on the jockey, not on the horse. In other words, the team is more important than the company in many cases. So if somebody is um, a founder – and they're going about it, and they went the first step, they got their friends and family to invest, or maybe they've invested all of their money, or they have customers, maybe they have, you know, a little bit of traction. Is there any resources here in Atlanta that you could recommend for that person so they can be prepared to take those next steps? Absolutely. The, the, in fact, for years, I would meet with entrepreneurs, and I would tell them, write this down, startupatlanta.com. Um, I'm on that board of directors as well, and uh, StartupAtlanta.com has uh, an ecosystem guide, which is an invaluable resource. It breaks down uh, everything from co-working spaces to incubators, accelerators, angel capital groups, venture capital groups, uh, even what you should be reading, like uh, At Atlanta Inno and Hypotamus are critical must-reads, as I say, for uh, both entrepreneurs and investors, they both do a great job of uh, covering the, the ecosystem itself. So Startup Atlanta is is a wonderful guide. And this year, we've done a few things uh, to improve it. At first, it, it, uh, up until this year, if you went on there uh, and asked to see the guide, what you got was a PDF, which was not very user friendly. And what we've done this year is digitized it, uh, still in those categories, all those different resources uh, to the best of our ability that are available. And if you see something you're interested in, you just click on it and you go right to that organization's homepage. The second thing we did um, in the spirit of diversity, equity, and inclusion is we developed a separate section for underserved entrepreneurs. Uh, and the headline there is inclusive innovation. So it's resources uh, organizations that focus on supporting entrepreneurs who are either female uh, or minorities. And the third thing we did, we actually added one just for women called female founders. So uh, when I would meet entrepreneurs, I would say, write this down. And it, it just breaks down the ecosystem and is uh, a great organization to make those resources available most of which uh, are free or at minimal cost to the entrepreneur. And there's, as, as you've done in past episodes, 
um, there's an awful lot of resources in Atlanta for entrepreneurs. Now, how do you uh, think Atlanta is doing when it comes to serving this um, maybe underserved community of entrepreneurs? Um, I, well, Panoramic, you start with them. They, they, they have shifted their focus from uh, Buckhead Investment Partners to renaming it Panoramic, and they are now focused, uh, if not exclusively, primarily on underserved entrepreneurs. And the program that they, they run, the Startup Showdown, uh, is a great indication of that. Um, but there's plenty of other organizations like Startup Runway. Um, you've had people from the Tech Village on. They have it Takes a Village program. Uh, the Russell Center is a, a, an incredible resource. It's going to revitalize the west side of Atlanta, uh, run by Jay Bailey. Um, it's a great organization. Uh, another one that I'm involved with is the Entrepreneurship Center at the Urban League of Greater Atlanta. We've helped literally hundreds of uh, entrepreneurs, and not just in technology, but in anybody that wants to start a business, the Urban League's uh, Entrepreneurship Center has programs for that. And things like Launchpad 2X, which supports uh, female entrepreneurs and new, very new resources like Greenwood Banking System, which just uh, bought the gathering spot. So there, there are numerous resources for uh, underserved entrepreneurs. And again, in StartupAtlanta.com, there's a section specifically targeting those folks. So I think Atlanta is way ahead of the curve uh, in, in supporting. I, you know, you hear numbers of, you know, 1% female or 3% black or whatever. But my experience in Atlanta, it's very, very different. In fact, the ATA tracked our investments from 2015 to 2020, and uh, literally 48% of the investments we made were in companies led by either women or minority entrepreneurs. So um, I think Atlanta might be leading the country in, in support in that area. Yeah, I think Atlanta's unique in that, you know, not only do we have uh, investors now that are willing to support these underserved, but also the robust university system. You mentioned ATDC a little bit. Uh, we're also involved with uh, GSU's uh, Entrepreneurship and Innovation Institute uh, <laughs> that's hitting it, you know, another group of people that are typically not served uh, yeah, by Dr. this. Dr. Shearer does a good job there. I've, I've been a mentor there as well. Um, and, and, and beyond Georgia Tech, Georgia State, Emory has an entrepreneurship uh, center. Um, the HBCUs. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, Morehouse has a tremendous program run by Tiffany Bussey. She does a great job. Uh, and, and one of the things that, that I've noticed in, in Atlanta, as well as just the DEI focus, is that all these disparate organizations, even if they could be considered competitive, the degree of cooperation and collaboration is is nothing like you see in like Philadelphia or New York, where in, in my opinion, it's often a zero sum game where the only way I can win is for you to lose. So I, 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 I've been amazed at the degree of support and cooperation, uh, volunteer efforts uh, that are that are out there and all the other mentors that do the startup slip showdown um, with panoramic is just, you know, one example. Now, you've had the opportunity to uh, live and travel around the country in uh, some of the largest cities in America. How would you, if you were kind of starting from scratch and trying to build an Atlanta type ecosystem, how would you recommend some of these, maybe not the largest cities, but maybe even secondary size cities do that to create that that um, ecosystem of col collaboration and cooperation amongst a, a variety of um you know, businesses and business associations? Uh, I, I think every significant city has them. Dallas, Austin, New York, Boston, obviously Silicon Valley with Y Combinator and all the resources out there. Um, but even I spent a couple of years in Chattanooga and uh, they have an uh, under the, uh, 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 the, uh, the, the, the league, uh, the chamber of commerce, excuse me. They have a, an organization, a building called the incubator, which uh, provides subsidized rent and uh, mentorship for entrepreneurships of all levels. And some tremendous successes have come out 
while I was there, I also was a mentor at what's called the, the CoLab or the Company Lab. Uh, again, it's a great facility in the heart of the city that offers free resources for entrepreneurs. So the entrepreneurship is alive and well, I believe, everywhere in the country and in maybe just to different degrees. But uh, again, with like, for example, with Venture Atlanta coming up here in October, there will be investors and entrepreneurs coming, not just from the Southeast, but some investors will come from San Francisco and New York and other places. So it's, it's compared to what the universe for entrepreneurship was, let's say just 10 or 15 years ago, it, it's a different world. Um, colleges um, like uh, Georgia State, for example, and Georgia Tech, they both, you can major in entrepreneurship um, as a major and, and courses targeting to that. Georgia Tech has the CreateX program, which uh, has very active support and financing for entrepreneurs. So there, there's a tremendous amount and it's very, it's very much more um, evident than it was several years ago. Yeah, it's so important uh, in today's world to even if they decide not to become an entrepreneur, but just to have that entrepreneur mindset of, you know, uh, experimenting, iterating, you know, selling something, you know, okay. networking, building relationships, all of these skills that you use as a, a founder are things that are transferable, whether you stay at, in the startup world or get a real corporate job. Absolutely. Um, in fact, there was a an article recently uh, interviewing Sig Mosley, considered the godfather of uh, angel investing, and he's also now a venture capitalist, as you know well. But uh, Sig says it all starts with sales. And um, one of the courses that I do lead a seminar at the ATDC is Sales Skills for Entrepreneurs. And I start with the headline that, you know, no sales, no business. And my background is in advertising, marketing, and sales. So that's that's where I try to help the entrepreneurs. Like, for example, at Georgia Tech, they're mostly engineering uh, or computer science of different types. Um, and I could name some cases where they had a great product but couldn't present to prospective customers at all. And uh, fortunately, most of them are coachable. And uh, one example that uh, – turned their sales around uh, that came out of Georgia Tech's dorms, literally, is the fixed app. A guy by the name of John Catuso started that. And last I heard, he was doing, and he struggled in the beginning to get sales. And uh, last I heard, he was doing about $125 million a year. So it's a process. And, right. and it can be learned. It's No one's born knowing how to sell and the cliche about the you know, fast talking salesman is just that it's a cliche. It's, 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 it's not the reality. Right. It's one of those things that a lot of people just kind of self-sabotage themselves because they have a, a, almost a bias against selling. They don't want to be seen as a salesperson or they have a negative connotation associated with selling. But yeah, like I, you said, if I can tell you a story personally, <laughs> um, when I was in college, I was, asked to interview by Procter and Gamble. And I did no homework. I showed up, I bummed a cigarette off the interview. And then I said, Oh, what are you interviewing for? And he said, sales. And I said, oh, I don't want to be in sales. And we had a nice chat. And uh, long story short, uh, after about five more interviews, I wound up working for Procter and Gamble in advertising. Yeah, which is, I mean, yeah, that's I, sales. I didn't want to be in sales, even though my <laughs> entire career is in is sales. It sales. Right. And like you said earlier, like nobody eats unless you sell something. So right. sales is at the heart of every organization, whether you want to be, want it or not. Right. So now, um, any advice for that um, kind of first-time founder, maybe somebody going through this process, if they were preparing for a startup showdown or one of these type events, what kind of advice would you give them in order to kind of make the most of that opportunity? I, I would strongly suggest they start with an incubator like uh, Atlanta Tech Village, like ATDC, like the Russell Center, um, like Launchpad 2X. Um, we all don't know what we don't know. And these organizations exist to support entrepreneurs, to help them learn what they need to do to start a good, thriving business. 
and having been involved with with several of them, they're they're all good. Um, what I would encourage entrepreneurs is to go to Startup Atlanta and look at the learning sources, the section there, and um, check them out. Um, there there are lots of resources, and like I said earlier. Most of them are free and or like, for example, ATDC charges, I believe, twenty five dollars a quarter, one hundred dollars a year paid in four installments. So, you know, most anybody can afford that. And, and candidly, that's just so people have um, skin in the game. I learned when I had a big expense account that clients, um, if there was no cost involved, there was no value. People would just blow off. You know, great opportunities for entertainment, meals, travel, whatever. Uh, so um, most of this stuff is is free or at minimal cost. And again, start with startupatlanta.com. So what's your favorite part of uh, working with uh, and mentoring startups and entrepreneurs? I get a jazz out of helping people succeed. Um, most recently with the Panoramic Startup Showdown, um, their last group, I, I had a chance to mentor a woman by the name of Ania Rodriguez in Miami, who has a, a company called Journey Track, which is basically helping user experience and HR kind of issues. And um, I'm not going to say that it was because of my coaching, but uh, when they had, I coached her in the, the semifinal round and she made it to the finals and then she won the $120,000 most recently. That was on the 15th of June. So um, to see someone go from struggling to having a real good start, um, it's, it's, it's very rewarding to me. Um, I haven't had a real job for about seven years, um, and it's my time to give back, which I really enjoy. And, you know, mentoring other companies, helping them with some stuff that they don't know, um, it, it's very rewarding. Well, Larry, thank you so much for sharing your story today. You're doing important work and we appreciate you. Uh, you mentioned startupatlanta.com. If somebody's interested in Atlanta Technology Angels, is there a website for them as well? Yes, that's angelatlanta.com or .org. And one more plug for Startup Atlanta. Um, the uh, applications for uh, Startup Atlanta annual awards is is now open until the 29th. And those awards will be held on October 12th. So uh, recognizing um, the, 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 uh, the people in the community that have done well and the, the people being honored this year as entrepreneurs of the year um, are Ben Ben Chestnut, who started MailChimp, and Andrew Young, who is one of the principals in Greenwood and, and obviously a former mayor of Atlanta. <laughs> right. Well, thank you again for sharing your story. You're doing important work, and we appreciate you. My pleasure, Lee. Glad to be here. All right. This is Lee Cantor. We'll see you all next time on Startup Showdown. As always, thanks for joining us. And don't forget to follow and subscribe to the Startup Showdown podcast so you get the latest episode as it drops wherever you listen to podcasts. To learn more and apply to our next Startup Showdown pitch competition, visit showdown.vc. That's showdown.vc. All right, that's all for this week. Goodbye for now.